On February 4th, The Minds of Madness is set to release an investigative four-part series centered on a cold case from nearly four decades ago. At first, it was just, my mom's gone. And then it became, you know, your mom was taken by a bad man. They found video of him killing women. If you'd ever watched any uh, episodes of Breaking Bad, that's exactly what you would see. He buried these 11 women and kept going out there. He made a road going out there. You got this dude saying, hey, I'm going to show your family these pictures. And, like, he's secretly taping her. The cops don't care. We're nothing to them. They dumped her like a piece of garbage, you know? I don't see anything that screams there's two people doing this. I never thought anything was going to come of this case. Ever. Listen to the Minds of Madness series, Who Killed Jennifer, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, True Advocates, it's me, Eric Carter Lundin, and I hope you are doing well. Sorry it's been so long. It has been a rough few weeks for me and my mom. We've just been trying to come to terms with everything that happened with Jacob's case. Speaking of that, I am doing a little bit of a different episode series for Crime Lines and Consequences for the month of March. And if you haven't subscribed to that show, I strongly recommend you do. It is myself and Charlie from Crime Lines having conversations that talk about the issues related to true crime and things that make you think. It's an amazing show. We have a really good time doing it, and it's awesome to be partnering with Charlie. But like I said, I recorded an update on Jacob's case. And it's going to be coming out in March. I'll also be releasing it on this feed as well, along with a new interview with my mom as we're coming through all of this information and revelations related to Jacob's case. Finally, I just want to let you know that I'm going to be at the True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival in Denver, Colorado. The True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival is July 12th through the 14th of 2024 in Denver, Colorado. Come and hang out with me at the True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival. Also, we're almost a year away from AdvocacyCon. AdvocacyCon is my new conference that I started with my friends Whitney and Melissa from Navigating Advocacy. So excited to be putting this conference on. There's going to be amazing speakers, amazing resources, as well as just the opportunity for family advocates to get to talk to PIs, to attorneys, to nonprofits. It's going to be an incredible time. Go to advocacycon.com for more information. If you want to go to True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival, go to truecrimepodcastfestival.com. And I think that's pretty much it. The only other thing I want to remind you of is Angels Voices Silence No More, my nonprofit that I started with my mom to help families who are fighting for justice in New Mexico. We provide grants that pay for things like funeral expenses, counseling, private investigations, DNA testing, Lots of things to help families of the missing and murdered to make sure that their advocacy efforts are able to be successful and that they don't that they no longer feel alone in the fight for justice. So go to angelsvoicesnm.org for more information. All right, that is enough of me blabbing. Let's get into the case. This episode does contain mentions of domestic violence and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. This episode was written and researched by Fern Bushnell. On Saturday, April 25th, 2015, the Gallup Police Department were called to the Colonial Motel twice by neighbors with concerns about the occupants of room 155. Each time the police showed up, they spoke with the occupants and no further action was taken. That was until 6 p.m. when a third 911 call was made, reporting an unconscious female found in the room. Despite the occupants claiming it must have been an accident, the scene suggested otherwise, and within 24 hours, the female would be pronounced dead. This is the story of Dion Begay Thomas. I'm Eric Carter Lundin, and this is True Consequences.
Dionne Begay was born on March 28, 1975. She was the oldest of six children and is described by her sister Christine as having a, po- a positive perspective on life and a witty sense of humor. She is dearly missed by her loved ones. Dionne was a beautiful, vibrant, outgoing, intelligent, and family-oriented woman. She was the mother of four daughters and had unique and close relationships with her entire family. Dion had several tribal connections. Dion had several tribal connections through her parents, Debbie and Laffy Begay. Debbie and Laffy Begay. Dion's mother Debbie is part of the Dakotas Youngton and Arikara tribe, and her father, the Navajo or Diné. As a Native American woman, Dion Begay is one of the many missing and murdered indigenous women from New Mexico who are yet to receive justice. Despite the, brutally inflict- despite the brutality inflicted upon her and the obvious circumstances of the crime, her family's pleas for help have continued to be ignored. We've talked a lot about missing and murdered indigenous people on this show. And the statistics that we're about to go over, we've talked about before as well. But I believe it's important to continue to reiterate these facts as the ongoing crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women continues across the nation. And although these statistics already seem alarming, they're probably not accurate. The picture is much larger than what is actually reported. Lots of families and communities affected by these crimes have spoken about a lack of concern for their missing and murdered loved ones. They receive little to no attention from police or media from the beginning, and in many cases, police reports are never filed. It's extremely difficult to find an exact number of MMIW cases currently being investigated. The National Crime Information Center reported 5,203 active cases of missing Indigenous women throughout the U.S. in 2021. They added that Indigenous women are twice as likely to be victims of rape than white women. The Native Women's Wilderness Organization says that over half of indigenous women have reported sexual violence and physical abuse within their relationships. Most concerning of all, the evidence shows that the third leading cause of death for indigenous women is murder. More specifically, in New Mexico, the Bureau of Indian Affairs state that Native American people make up approximately 11% of the population and data provided by the MMIW task force shows that New Mexico continues to hold the highest rate of MMIW cases when compared to the rest of the country. Gallup, New Mexico, the location of the crime in this case, is recognized as one of the top 10 most dangerous cities to live in as a Native American woman. The reality is that cases involving Native Americans regularly lack even a basic investigation, and agencies are known to work together to wrongfully classify suspicious deaths as accidents, suicides, or even the result of natural causes in order to quickly remove the case from their workload. In some cases, victims have been cremated without the consent of their family prior to a criminal investigation taking place, eliminating the chance of finding any evidence to be used in any kind of investigation. Because of this, The National Women's Indigenous Resource Center explained that families and communities of Native American women must conduct their own investigations into their missing or murdered loved ones due to the unwillingness of police to prioritize these victims. In many cases, it's the families of the victims who will eventually locate their loved one's body. And many of these factors continue to be a theme throughout Dion's case, as her sister Christine continues to advocate for justice and keep Dion's story at the forefront of people's minds. The following background information was obtained from my good friend and co-host Charlie from the Crime Lines podcast. She also covers Dion's case as part of her MMIW series. Charlie also provides a brief history of the tribes that Dion's family was a part of. If you're interested in learning more about the history of the Begay family, go check out Charlie's podcast. And even if you're not interested in that, Still, go check out Charlie's podcast. She is an amazing storyteller. Thank you, Charlie, for providing this research for us. Dion was married in her 20s. However, the marriage eventually broke down and the pair had separated in her 30s. She reconnected and began a relationship with an old high school friend, Anthony Ray. 
Anthony's negative influence on Dion's life quickly became apparent, and Dion began to become more distant from her family and friends, as well as her children. Dion and Anthony were often unreachable for long periods of time and could not be pinned down to one place. They traveled around together, staying in motels and other means of temporary accommodation throughout the state of New Mexico, and more specifically, in Gallup. During this difficult period of her life, Dion increasingly began to get into trouble with law enforcement, and her parents had obtained full custody of her four children. Her family believed that Dion and Anthony had become dependent on alcohol and were also aware that Dion was experiencing domestic violence within her relationship. This created an obvious strain between Dion and her parents, who did not approve of the relationship because they were worried for her safety. However, they did not want to push her away and made it clear to Dion that she was welcome to come home whenever she wanted, insisting that they would always be there for her if she reached out to them. The family would receive updates about the status of Dion and Anthony's relationship through several of Dion's closest friends. Unfortunately, the Begay family had not heard from Dion in the few days prior to her murder, and they have also had to piece together the following information themselves by obtaining witness statements and police reports. Gallup, New Mexico sits on the outskirts of the Navajo Nation and is around 140 miles west of Albuquerque. Gallup is situated on Route 66, a historic highway that stretches 2,448 miles between Chicago and Los Angeles. It was in Gallup's Colonial Motel along Route 66 where Dion and Anthony were staying together during this period. Her sister Christine describes the Colonial Motel as a motel known locally for housing criminals, people who are running, and the unhoused. Christine says that police officers were aware of the unsafe reputation that the Colonial Motel had during that period, and they were also very aware of the danger presented by Dion's abusive boyfriend, Anthony Ray. Despite this, on Saturday, April 25th, 2015, when police began to receive reports of, domestic dis- of a domestic disturbance occurring in room 155, they did not take appropriate action and left Dion in an extremely vulnerable situation. According to the police report, a neighbor staying in room 156 had called the police at 9.07 in the morning to report that they heard yelling, banging, and screaming coming from the room next door. When officers Luke Martin and Francie Martinez arrived at the motel, they knocked on room 155. They were greeted by a short, heavyset Native American male who would later turn out to be Milton Garnanes, Anthony Ray's brother-in-law. The police report goes on to say that Milton insisted everything was okay, and the police officer observed two females within the room who were talking and laughing. Milton also indicated that Anthony Ray was in the shower singing. The officer noted a pack of beer and an intoxicating odor of liquor coming from the room. Officer Martinez told the group to keep it down and was reassured by Milton that they would before the two officers left. Another report came in approximately four and a half hours later at 1.41 p.m., another disturbance from room 155. This time, the neighbor reported that Anthony Ray was yelling, cussing, and threatening to fight him. Officer Martinez returned to the Colonial Motel and this time states that he met with Anthony Ray directly. He again notes the overwhelming smell of liquor coming from Anthony and asked him to explain what was going on. Anthony told the officer he was angry because the neighbor kept calling the police to complain and described an argument between them where Anthony accused the neighbor of probably being a child molester. That was in quotes. After confirming with the motel staff that Anthony was registered to the room, Officer Martinez returned to Anthony Ray and received an apology from him. Anthony told the officer that he would apologize to the neighbor and that he would be quiet. And with that, the officers left. There's no mention within the police report of Dion's well-being during this visit. However, another 911 call was placed at approximately 6 p.m. the very same day. This time, paramedics were requested by Anthony Ray. He claimed to have, quote, discovered Dion Begay Thomas unresponsive in their motel room. While on the phone with 911, Anthony Ray said that he believed that Dion had fell and hit her head. Upon arrival to the scene, the EMTs Josh Bond and Kyle Leslie were immediately suspicious of the two males present. Initial media reports state that Dion was bleeding from the head 
and unconscious. And both EMTs reported that it looked as though somebody had attempted to put clothes on Dion, as her underwear was not on correctly. There were also signs that someone had attempted to clean her up. Dion was rushed to the Gallup Indian Medical Hospital, and police were called to the hospital, due to the suspicion that Dion had been sexually assaulted. Officer Francie Martinez arrived at the hospital at around 8 p.m. and recognized the males as those he had encountered in the Colonial Motel earlier that day, Anthony Ray and Milton Garnanes. Officer Martinez then spoke to Anthony to obtain his version of events. Anthony claimed that he and Milton had left the motel at around 5.30 p.m. to go to the Fire Rock Casino to cash in a winning voucher worth around $40 so that they could pay their rent. He stated that Dion remained in the motel during this time, and when they returned around 10 minutes later, the pair were unable to get into their motel room. Anthony claims that he knocked repeatedly, but Dion didn't answer, so he asked the maid for assistance to let them back into the room. After gaining entry, the police report states that Anthony went to the restroom while Milton was doing his, quote, thing in the room. He claimed that after he came out of the restroom, he went to wake up Dion, who appeared to be asleep. It was then that he noticed Dion was bleeding from her head, and blood was visible on her hand. He and Milton then began looking for a blood trail, but were unable to locate one. And after failing to wake up Dion, or gain any response from her, they decided to call 911. When questioned further, Anthony stated that the pair had been drinking for two weeks straight when he and Milton had left her in the motel room. Dion was intoxicated and watching TV. He believed that Dion may have hit her head on the bedpost and fallen to the floor, and that the blood on her hand may have been the result of her holding her hand to her head following the initial injury. However, police began to question his version of events, and given the circumstances earlier that day, they immediately suspected foul play occurred. Doctors informed Detective Tanisha Wilson that Dion was noted as having a subdural hematoma as well as a cut on her forehead, and she showed signs of injury which indicated a sexual assault. At approximately 9 p.m., medical staff determined that Dion's injuries were too severe to be treated at the Gallup Indian Medical Center, and Dion was flown to the trauma center at the University of New Mexico Hospital in Albuquerque. Shortly after Dion's family were notified, Christine says that Dion was covered in tubes, unconscious, and had visible bruising all over her body. Sadly, the family were told that Dion was unlikely to survive due to her severe brain injury. And at 9.21 a.m. the next morning, Dion was pronounced dead by medical staff. Her official cause of death was listed as blunt force trauma to the head. Dion was only 40 years old. The investigation into Dion's murder began immediately, and officers secured the motel room and began to speak to the occupants of the neighboring rooms to find out more information about what occurred. It was these witnesses who provided a more harrowing view of events that painted an entirely different picture from what Anthony Ray had initially claimed in the hospital. The first people that police spoke to that day were the motel owner and his son, Kevin Kumar. Earlier that day, Kevin had witnessed Anthony Ray angrily leaving his motel room shouting fuck you as he angrily slammed the door to the room behind him. Mr. Kumar asked Anthony to keep it down, to which Anthony replied, who the fuck are you? This was the first time you've heard me being loud today. Mr. Kumar decided not to engage with Anthony and walked away. He then observed Anthony walking up to the passenger side of his truck. Second witness, Cheryl Wilson, was walking by the motel at around 3 p.m. when she heard a male yelling at a female but could not see which male it was. Cheryl was then approached by a female named Shannon who asked Cheryl if she was aware that Anthony Ray had a girlfriend. Cheryl replied that she didn't know Shannon, then told her that she had observed the female, Anthony's girlfriend, bleeding from the head. Cheryl responded that she didn't know either Dion or Anthony and carried on past the motel. Police then spoke to Charles Gonzalez, who was occupying room 154 next door to Dion and Anthony. He claimed that at 2 p.m. he heard Anthony Ray and a female arguing and quoted the female as saying, You disrespect me. You had sex with her before the female left the motel room in a hurry. It is not clear whether this female was Dion or the other unknown female observed by officers earlier that morning. 
Finally, police spoke to Daniel Skeen, who observed Milton Garnanes get into the white van outside of the motel after officers had left for the second time that day. When he returned, Milton was unable to get back into the motel room and waited in the van for around 45 minutes for Anthony Ray to return. Daniel noted that Anthony was also unable to gain access to the room at this time. These witness statements provide a clear picture of that day involving Anthony Ray's violent mood, his physical and verbal abuse to Dion, an observation of her bleeding from the head hours before the ambulance was called, and clear discrepancies in the timeline of when Milton and Anthony were present in the room with Dion. Despite this, Anthony Ray denies an argument took place between him and Dion and claims that there was no physical altercation between them. His statement that Dion was drunk would turn out to be false, as her family later received a copy of the toxicology report that disputed these claims. The officers finished taking witness statements at around 10 p.m. on the evening of April 25th before locating and towing Milton Garnanis' vehicle back to the Gallup Police Department, where further analysis could be conducted by investigators. On May 1st, 2015, Gallup Police Captain Rick White made a statement to the Gallup Sun stating, quote, we are actively investigating this as a homicide, end quote. This is also what the investigating officers led the Begay family to believe. Christine said that in the initial days of the investigation, they were happy, they were being taken seriously, and they worked with police and supported everything that they were doing as they believed they were investigating the circumstances of Dion's death. She says the family went to the police station, met with a district attorney, and worked alongside investigators to be as cooperative as possible. Eventually, they were told to let the police do their jobs, as they, quote, already knew it was Anthony Ray. They were aware that he was abusive to Dion, and his long history of felony charges told them everything they needed to know about Anthony's character. Eventually, though, the Begay family began to grow frustrated with the lack of communication from detectives working Dion's case, and they would only receive updates when they persisted in asking for them. Like many families of murdered indigenous women, they began their own investigation. They compiled as much information as possible to support their case. Christine said that the family returned to making repeated visits to the police station and calling for updates. Her mother, Debbie, would document all attempts of communication on their part, which often were ignored by police. And despite claiming to know exactly what happened and reassuring the family that Anthony Ray would be found responsible, the reality of what happened was the complete opposite. The day that Dion was attacked, Anthony Ray had charges filed against him for the aggravated assault of a family member. However, he only spent a few hours in police custody that evening before he was released back to the public. In addition, the motel room that Dion and Anthony shared was cleaned and reopened to the public just a few days after her murder. Christine says that Anthony moved to a new room a few doors down from 155 and shamelessly took all of Dion's possessions with him, which angered her family even more. In a meeting held by the New Mexico MMIW Task Force, Christine documents how helpless they all felt during this period. She said that in 2018, the family met with the district attorney and were left feeling dismissed. Although the DA admitted that he had thought the investigation wasn't as thorough as it could have been, he gave them the impression that he had no intention to follow up on the case and did not offer any kind of assistance to change the outcome. Christine explained that similarly to the information discussed earlier, Dion's murder continues to be considered, quote, unclassified until official charges are filed. And because of this, Dion is not included in the statistics of MMIW cases in New Mexico. Christine is quoted as saying, at this point in time, her official ruling of death is undetermined, and we cannot as a family do anything to change that. We've done everything. We've made calls. We've gone in person. It will not be classified as a homicide because we have seven years of a statute of limitations to press charges against her boyfriend. And if nothing happens from outside political public pressure, we know that charges will not go. We can go and sit at the district attorney's office. We can make phone calls. We can go in person. We can demand justice. We can be as polished, polite, respectful, educated as we want to be in all of this. And it will not move the system that has allowed for this to go on for so long. The precedent has been set in Gallup, New Mexico. If you want to get away with murder, do it there. And make sure that it's a native woman because they won't come looking for who did it. This I know. I've seen it. 
it's heartbreaking. And unfortunately, it is the reality that many families of the missing and murdered indigenous people experience. It is so common. Christine's experience battling with the justice system has left her feeling totally helpless when fighting for Dion. These feelings are also shared by her family. The task force meeting held in Albuquerque in 2019 was an opportunity for the relatives and communities of MMIW to come together to discuss their shared experiences of police incompetence and failure to prosecute when it came to investigating cases of their loved ones. Dion's aunt Charlotte described the first few months following Dion's death as foggy. The family didn't know what to do and continued to hope that they would receive a call from police to say that an arrest had been made, but the call never came. Charlotte explained that one thing that she wished she had been offered following Dion's death was counseling. She struggled to come to terms with what had happened while also consoling other members of her family who were also struggling with grief. She states that as a Native American mother, she finds it hard to reach out for help because of the stigma associated with receiving counseling or support from social workers. She said this makes her feel as though she is weak or that something is wrong with her. However, having good protocols in place allowing people to access support would have really helped during those initial months following Dion's death. Following this meeting, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives Report was published in 2020, highlighting Dion's case. The report outlined several recommendations to tackle the ongoing crisis of MMIW cases in New Mexico. This includes the importance of data involving missing and murdered Indigenous women being recorded and documented accurately, the need for support packages to be offered to grieving families, providing additional resources to the tribal justice system to enable successful prosecutions, preventative methods such as educational packages, such as educational programs designed to promote safety within Indigenous communities, Law enforcement recommendations such as establishing a permanent MMIW task force, including a cold case team for cases exactly like Dion's. And finally, the development of community resources available to those in tribal communities. In conclusion, they emphasize the work carried out to create the report is an ongoing work in progress. And they add, quote, We learn that families and survivors must be centered and must continue to guide the work moving forward as knowledgeable resources on all areas of MMIWR, the willingness and participation of these brave voices guided the work of this task force. Unfortunately, the governor disbanded this task force. It no longer exists. Throughout the initial meeting and the final report with the MMIW task force, Dion's sister Christine spoke of the emotional effects the loss of Dion has brought to her entire family. Dion's four daughters were devastated by the loss of their mother, and their lives were impacted heavily as a result. The cruel way that Dion was taken and the way they were treated by law enforcement added to their feelings of frustration and despair. After learning that Anthony Ray had been released just hours after his arrest, while Dion was being flown to UNMH for an emergency surgery, these feelings continued to worsen, and family began to scramble for answers. Christine admitted that her experience of being ignored by the police and several other organizations that she hoped would help led her to complete lack of faith in the justice system. Charlotte, Dion's aunt, says that she cried daily for Dion's children who were visibly shocked, angry, and confused by the loss of their mother. And she explained that they continue to have these feelings despite the many years that have passed. In May 2022, hundreds of people gathered in the Santa Fe Plaza to mark the final day of the 2022 National Walk of Action of MMIWR. The event was held by the Three Sisters Collective, an organization established in 2017, which seeks to create safe spaces for indigenous people across the state. On their website, the Three Sisters Collective write that they have hosted several events to bring awareness to the MMIW crisis. They also offer education, self-defense classes, and more. During the vigil, the co-founder of the organization, Christina Castro, read aloud the names of the many missing and murdered women within the community. This portion of the vigil took around 10 minutes to complete and demonstrated the vast number of victims listed, as well as the devastation left behind. 
At the vigil, Christina Castro is quoted as saying, We deserve to be human. We deserve to live with integrity as indigenous women and matriarchs and two-spirited relatives. So speak loud, speak those names into the universe, and keep the memory of our loved ones alive. Dion's sister hopes to create change for families like hers and many others who may not have the resources to fight publicly. She uses her experience to bring attention to the many disparities that the loved ones of the MMIW face and the impact of her words within the task force report demonstrate the importance of victim participation when demanding change and justice. Christine runs a Facebook page called Justice for Dion Thomas where she shares updates on Dion's case. She talks about her work with the task force and other online events intended to spread awareness about the MMIWR crisis. If you have any information or tips about Dion's case, please contact either the Facebook page or the Gallup Police at 505-863-9365 or 505-722-2281. Thanks for listening and stay safe, New Mexico.